You want controversy? I'm going to give it to you. Should Donald Trump be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize? Should he get the Nobel Peace Prize? You're going to hear my arguments on this show today. Why, under the criteria for the Nobel Peace Prize, he should be a shoe in Is he going to get it? Don't know. I want to hear your views when we discuss the Nobel Peace Prize and Donald Trump on The Dirt Show. If you're enjoying uh, The Dirt Show, and I'm getting so many nice emails and letters and calls from people who are loving the show, loving my comments, loving the comments that I'm getting from uh, people who are calling in. If you enjoy the show, please help others discover us by giving us a rating and a review. I, I'm used to giving the grades, not getting them, but um, I'm ready to be graded. So please grade me and, and grade me honesty. No great inflation. Whatever you think, give us a review. And be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Durst Show. And remember my promise, you will never be bored. The presidential election of 2020 looks like it's now coming to an end. The transition is moving forward. The president has not conceded defeat. Indeed, um, lawsuits are persisting. Um, in Georgia, we're told that a lawsuit will be filed by Sidney Powell, um, although she has been disassociated from the president's defense team. It may expose some problems with the computers. We'll wait and see if she has the evidence to support her very, very broad claims of uh, conspiracy. I have my own doubts uh, about that. Um, on a uh, television show, I was told she would be filing a lawsuit based on biblical considerations. I suggested that the biblical reference may be more appropriately to Potiphar's wife in the Bible, who had falsely accused Joseph of trying to sexually assault her. Uh, the Bible can be used for good and for evil. It presents both good and evil scenarios, condemning the evil and praising the good. Uh, but the Bible isn't what's going to change this election, nor do I suspect will Sidney Powell's lawsuits. There are lawsuits going forward in Pennsylvania as well, but... Uh, I think that in the end, the certifications by Pennsylvania and Michigan, um, Georgia, soon other states will seal the deal and will make it clear that the presumed president-elect is in fact the president-elect. He will soon have more than the 270 certified electors necessary to win, and then it's only a matter of meeting and counting the vote. So I think for purposes of any future discussion, we should assume, whether you like it or not, this is not, again, stating preferences or wishful thinking, we should assume the next president of the United States will be uh, Joe Biden. He is already assembling his cabinet. So far, it's a centrist cabinet, mm, reflective of the prior Obama, uh, eight years, uh, some new faces, uh, mostly faces that are familiar to uh, Democrats. Uh, the progressive wing is increasingly unhappy. Uh, they're trying to stop um, Biden from appointing as a secretary of defense, somebody who's regarded as a two centrist. Uh, they're not happy with the selection for secretaries of state, national security and others. They want their own to be appointed in positions of authority, and um, hopefully that will not happen because it would be bad for America, be bad for the Democratic Party, and I believe it would be bad for the world. So it's time to move on, and one of the ways of moving forward is by looking backward. Um, I think it was the great philosopher Santayana who said, those who neglect the lessons of the past are destined to uh, repeat them. So I want to look back a little bit um, and uh, at the same time look forward. And I need your advice on this, my listeners and viewers, because I'm thinking of publishing probably the most controversial op-ed 
that I've ever published. And boy, I've published a lot of newsies and I've gotten into a lot of controversy over things I've said and done. I've hinted at it on this show, but I want to lay it out now for you because I need your advice. I have in my hand the draft <laughs> of an article I'm working on entitled, Should President Trump Win the Nobel Peace Prize? Uh, and if I publish this article, uh, I will become uh, increasingly a pariah to the left, to the We Hate Trump group, to the Anybody But Trump group, to We Ought to Punish Anybody Who Had Anything to Do With Trump group. Uh, not only would I publish this uh, article, but I would actually, as a nominator, I'm an official nominator for the Nobel Peace Prize because I'm a professor of public law and professors emeritus are included in the nominating group. I would actually propose nominating uh, President Trump, along with others, and I'll get to the others in a minute, for the Nobel Peace Prize. And finally, I would go to Harvard um, when the pandemic is over or before that by Zoom and make a speech on why uh, the, the case for Trump and others getting the Nobel Peace Prize is a strong one and why students and faculty at Harvard ought to hear, along with all the negatives which they hear about every day of the Trump administration, some of the positives. And I think the legacy of President Trump will be in foreign policy. And the centerpiece of that legacy will be his dealings in the Middle East will be his helping others to accomplish what others before him had not been able to accomplish, namely normalizing relations between Israel um, and the United Arab Emirates and, and, and Bahrain and Sudan and perhaps in the future others. I think part of his legacy will also be moving the U.S. Embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, officially recognizing Jerusalem as the enduring capital of Israel, recognizing Israel's right to maintain control over the Golan Heights, and uh, hopefully um, inviting uh, the Palestinians and Israelis to sit down and negotiate around his peace plan, which I played a very small role in uh, looking at, evaluating, critiquing, and consulting on. That peace plan has not been accepted by the Palestinians, just the way they rejected the peace plan offered by President Clinton in 2000 and 2001, the way they rejected the peace plan offered by uh, Prime Minister Ulmer in 2008, the way they failed to act on um, uh, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon's uh, leaving of the Gaza Strip, uh, emptying it of all Israeli military and uh, civilians. Uh, the Palestinians have never been able to take yes for an answer and never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And here, President Trump and his team gave the Palestinians an opportunity to make peace, a good peace, a peace that would give them a state, a, gate, a peace that would give them a Marshall Plan. But they rejected it and uh, not only rejected it, but refused to sit down and negotiate about, about anything. And I think as the result of that, they lost a lot of their credibility with the Sunni um, Arab, Sunni Muslim states, particularly in the Gulf region, particularly those that are opposed to Iran. And it became, I think, a stimulus for some of these countries to say, look, we care about the Palestinians, we care deeply about them, but they're not helping themselves. And we can't allow the Palestinians to veto our efforts to normalize relationships with Israel. I think that was the brilliance of the Abraham Accords and the initiatives that led to them, a recognition that the Palestinians no longer have or should have a veto over peace between Israel and its uh, Arab neighbors. Do they still have a veto between Israel and the Saudi government? We'll wait and see. Uh, those are, those are uh, pieces of work that still haven't been accomplished. The same thing with Lebanon. The same thing with Iraq, whatever that government is, the mixed government of Iraq, which is largely under the control of Iran and partly under the control of the United States. The Middle East is a very, very complicated place. But let's turn now to the case four, including uh, President Trump among the recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize. Start, as always, with the text. Uh, you know, if you read the Constitution, you start with the text. 
if you think about the Nobel Peace Prize, you start with the text. And so here is the criteria from the will of Alfred Nobel, the man who gave the money for the Nobel Peace Prize as well as the other Nobel Prizes in medicine, chemistry, etc. The prize should go to the person, and it's been interpreted to mean the person or persons group, the person or persons who has done the most or best to advance fellowship among nations, the abolition or reduction of standing armies, and the establishment and promotion of peace congresses. I challenge anybody to name an event this year which better meets those criteria. Obviously, the accord uh, advances fellowship among nations. It normalizes relationship between Israel and three countries that were essentially in states of war against it. They weren't hot wars, but they were cold wars. Uh, there was a time when you couldn't go to any of those countries if you had been in Israel, had Israel stamped on your passport. There were times you couldn't go to some of those countries if you had a name like Dershowitz or Goldberg or Friedman or any other name that was identifiably Jewish. And um, just yesterday I, I saw a videotape of a food market, a fresh food market in uh, the United Arab Emirates. And there you see the flag of Israel next to the flag of the United Arab Emirates as you walk into the food market. And then you see items from Israel, avocados and oranges, all labeled from Israel with the Israeli flag, the Star of David, on the product signs to attract people, saying, hey, these are products from Israel. You really want to have them because we're trying to make peace and normalcy with Israel. So this isn't even a cold peace. It looks like a warm peace. A synagogue has opened in the United Arab Emirates. Um, uh, Israeli Jews are moving there to do business. I'm sure Israeli Arabs will move there to do business as well, hopefully Palestinians too. So this is a great event. This is a, a groundbreaking uh, event, a breakthrough that may foreshadow increasing peace between Israel and other Arab countries and in my view, may help to bring the Palestinians to the bargaining table and may in the end result in a state for Palestinians. So this is a, a great accomplishment. And I hope and pray that President-elect Biden will build on this accomplishment and will try to extend the uh, number of states uh, that recognize and normalize relation with relationships with Israel. Certainly his team, his national security team, would seem to be in favor of that if it could happen. And frankly, if President-elect Biden manages to extend the peace initiatives and bring about peace with the Palestinians, I would propose him for the next uh, Nobel uh, Peace Prize. The Nobel Peace Prize is nonpartisan. It's supposed to be objective. And so, if you agree with me, and I don't think anybody can dispute this, I wait to hear from anybody who can dispute this. I'm sure I'll get people disputing it when I publish the article. But if you agree with me that the event, the Abraham Accords, is the event that deserves the Nobel Peace Prize, then the next question is which individuals who help bring about that event are deserving of getting the medal itself, the Nobel Prize itself. My understanding is that four people uh, can get it. It's limited to four. They have to be living people. There are two groups of people who would qualify for the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize. The 2020 has obviously already been given, but 2021 would recognize the accomplishments of 2020 as previous Nobel Prizes have recognized accomplishments of the past year. And the two groups of people include, first, the leaders uh, who actually signed the accords, um, and that would include President Trump, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and the leaders of the emirates, the emirs of the emirates that initially signed the accords, uh, namely Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates. That's one group of people. That would make a lot of sense. 
the other group of people would be more focused on the United States, and that is the team uh, that helped uh, facilitate the accords from the United States. That would be President Trump, uh, Secretary Mike Pompeo, Ambassador David Friedman, uh, Jared Kushner, and Avi Berkowitz, the people on the ground who pushed this and traveled almost on a daily basis to these countries to help bring the parties uh, together. Either group of people would, would qualify, but since both groups include um, President Donald Trump, there will be pushback. There will be those who will say, no, 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 under no circumstances can Trump ever get the Nobel Peace Prize. We don't approve of his presidency. We think he did terrible things on immigration, on health care, on gun control, you name it. There'll be opposition to a range of his policies, and I would share some of that opposition. I'm not uh, supportive of uh, the immigration policy or health care policies or some of the other policies of the administration, but that's not what the Nobel Prize is about. It's for the singular achievement of doing the most or the best to bring about the three criteria. And if you want to look to precedent, uh, there have been many people who've gotten the Nobel Peace Prize who you might say, if you looked at the totality of their careers, questions are raised as to whether they deserved it. Obviously, three that come to mind immediately are uh, Henry Kissinger, who got the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, along with the negotiator from, uh, from Vietnam uh, for bringing about a ceasefire uh, there. Uh, he was regarded by some as a warmonger uh, before he got the Peace Prize, and yet he got the Peace Prize. I don't agree with the characterization of him as a warmonger. I'm just stating what others have said about him. Uh, an even more striking example, obviously, would be Yasser Arafat, who was a terrorist who had the blood of thousands of people on his hands, and he got the Nobel Peace Prize uh, along with Shimon Peres and, uh, and, and uh, Yitzhak Rabin, for the Oslo Accords back in the early 1990s. Uh, surely, if you look at Yasser Arafat's career, the word peace and Arafat don't belong together, but he got the prize shared with others for the singular achievement of the Oslo Accords, which unfortunately did not produce the peace that it promised. Another one would be Anwar Sadat, who everybody admires and looks up to, and you might say, Anwar Sadat, how do you put him in the same company as Arafat or even Kissinger, Anwar Sadat is a saint. No, 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 no. Anwar Sadat was not a saint early in his uh, career. He fomented terrorism. He encouraged terrorism. He belonged to uh, a neo-Nazi organization early in his uh, youth. And uh, even in as late as 1973, uh, just uh, before he got the Nobel uh, Peace Prize, he initiated a war with Israel. He started the Yom Kippur War. He attacked a country and killed many of its soldiers and some of its civilians in an unprovoked, aggressive war on the holiest day of the Jewish calendar. Yet, of course, he got the prize because after that war, he helped bring about the peace, the cold peace that still exists between Israel and Egypt. So nobody is proposing President Trump or his team for a prize in immigration policy, or for a prize in health policy, or for a prize in introducing civil language into our uh, discourse. I would not support uh, any such uh, prizes, uh, but he is being considered for the singular accomplishment of the uh, Abraham Accords. And uh, it's hard to make the case against that. Uh, look, Contrast that with the last American president who got the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, and, and that was President Barack Obama, who got it shortly after he was sworn in as president, before he had accomplished anything meeting the criteria for the Peace Prize. Uh, he got the prize not because of what he had done, but because of who he was, the first African-American president, a liberal Democrat, and more importantly, he got the prize because of who he wasn't. He wasn't George W. Bush, who, according to the Nobel Committee, I'm sure their deliberations, would be the last person to get the prize because he attacked Afghanistan and he attacked the Iraq. And uh, so uh, when Barack Obama uh, got elected, they gave him the Peace Prize, not because of what he had done, but because of who he was. 
That's exactly the wrong criteria. The Peace Prize is not an ad hominem award to a person for being a good person. That's not what the Peace Prize is. It's for accomplishing the three criteria set out in the will of Alfred Nobel. And under those criteria, clearly President Trump deserves it far, far more than President Obama. Oh, people might argue maybe Obama deserved it later on for the Iran deal. Boy, I wouldn't support that. I don't think the Iran deal has helped peace or reduced standing armies or improved fellowship among nations. But, you know, you could make that argument. He did bring about the Iran peace deal, but he hadn't done that at the time he got the Nobel Peace Prize. So we have to look at the Nobel Peace Prize for what it is, not a generic ad hominem prize for people we like, but for actions that have been taken. And uh, by that criteria, it's a strong case, a strong case for President Trump to be included. It's also a strong case for President-elect Biden to aspire to get the next one or one after that, if he can build on the Abraham Accords and bring about even greater peace and maybe even peace between Israel and the Palestinians. So tell me whether I should write this article. Tell me whether I should make a speech about it at Harvard. Tell me what I can expect in terms of pushback. Look, I think I always do things as a matter of principle, not as a matter of, of partisanship, not as a matter of popularity, not as a matter of um, what is going to be good for me or uh, for people around me. Uh, I think as a matter of principle, as a matter of precedent, as a matter of what the Nobel Peace Prize is supposed to be accorded for, there is a strong case for President Trump to be included. You can still continue to oppose him. You can still continue to hate him. You could vote against him. You can do all of those things. People have those attitudes, obviously, toward Kissinger and obviously toward Arafat. But a prize is supposed to be accorded for what the criteria are. And under the criteria of the Nobel Peace Prize, it's hard for me to imagine the 2021 prize being given to a group that didn't include President Trump. Now, will it happen? You know, I often make predictions. I say I don't engage in, in willful thinking. I don't think so. I think the composition of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee is such that it would be a long, long, long shot. It would be the right thing to do, but it's probably not going to happen. That shouldn't stop me, and it's not going to stop me from advocating it, publishing my article writing a letter to the Nobel Committee, and making my speech at Harvard. But I want your views on that. You're the listeners. You're more objective. You can tell me what you think I ought to do. I may listen. I may not listen. I will certainly listen. But I may accept your views or not accept your views. But I take very seriously the callers on this show. So please call The Der Show. And now we're going to turn to our great callers. Our first call today is from Noel in Florida. Hi, Professor. Thank you very much for your incredible podcast. It's been fascinating. Uh, I feel like I had gone to law school. My son and I were calling or having a conversation. The conversation had to do, obviously, with something theoretical. The U.S. Senate is split 50-50. For whatever reason, the vice president becomes president. And something is obviously to replace the vice president. The Senate is locked at 50-50. Does the vice president or former vice president, now president, get to cast the deciding vote? I don't think that's happened in history. Uh, could you please give us some information? It's never happened in history, and I think the answer is probably no. Uh, you can't be both president and vice president at the same time. If you become president, you're no longer vice president. There's a vacancy in the vice presidency, and until that's filled, and it can be filled, there's an amendment to the Constitution that provides that the president nominates and it has to go through uh, Congress. But until that happens, a 50-50 vote defeats a vote. That is, uh, the vote doesn't carry on 50-50. You need a majority. So if there is no vice president, and th throughout our history, we've had periods of time, long periods of time, when there's been no vice president, uh, long, long periods of time, two, three years, in those instances, a 50-50 tie 
doesn't uh, turn an act into a law. Our next call is Brad from California. I enjoy the show very much, but specifically the question I have is that obviously, as you said many times, you're Jewish and you support the state of Israel, and I'm a moderate Republican, and I, I agree with that. And what I find in my experience is that the Republican Party tends to be more pro-Israel, and they also tend to be pro, uh, I think, a little more supportive of, of being Jewish as a religion. And a good buddy of mine is Jewish, and I ask him sometimes, why, why, is the Jew, why are Jews predominantly Democrats? And his answer to me has been, I really don't know. So I wanted to position that question to you and see what your thoughts are. Why, since in my view at least, many of the Democrats, not all of course, are not pro-Israel and are not pro-Jewish, why are so many Jews uh, pro-Democrat? It's a great question. I've asked that question a lot. I ask it myself sometimes, and there's no definitive answer. But let me lay out what I think the answers are. I think Jews often vote their memories. Um, I think people in general tend to vote memories. Um, most of our parents were Democrats. Our grandparents were Democrats. Uh, I grew up in a house where there was one picture on the wall, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, everybody adored Franklin Delano Roosevelt, even though he wasn't necessarily the best president uh, in terms of helping Jews during the Holocaust. But he was uh, regarded as a demigod uh, by many, certainly New York Jews that I I grew up with. Uh, so I think that's that's one uh, uh, answer. Um, also, historically, the Democratic Party has been very supportive of Israel. It was Harry Truman who first recognized uh, Israel. Dwight Eisenhower wasn't as supportive of Israel. So when I was growing up, the Democratic Party was more supportive of Israel than the Republican Party was. George H.W. Bush was not regarded as particularly supportive of Israel. But today, you're absolutely right. The Republican Party, particularly its evangelical Christian wing, is very strongly supportive of Israel, and most Republicans are more supportive of Israel than particularly young Democrats. Polls recently show that young Democrats are decreasingly supportive of Israel and increasingly supportive of Palestinians. Uh, and so the question uh, remains why. I think one answer is that Jews have become very assimilated and very much part of the broad, general American liberal culture. And for many Jews, Israel is not the highest uh, priority, and Jewish values are not the highest priority. Their values tend to be the environment, uh, woman's right to choose, gay marriage, reasonable gun control, fair taxation, health care. And so um, the Democratic Party is better on those issues. A good analogy is to Great Britain. In Great Britain, Jews for years always associated with labor for the same reasons, uh, liberal, labor. Uh, and then several things happened. Number one, the conservative party was, is not in England a social conservative party. The conservative party supports a woman's right to choose abortion, supports gay marriage, opposes the death penalty, uh, supports the environment. They're just very conservative on foreign policy, on economic policy. And added to that, the Labor Party became anti-Semitic under Jeremy Corbyn. And so you saw a massive movement of Jews from labor to conservatives. Um, I would become a conservative uh, today in America if the Republican Party, I would become a Republican, if the Republican Party favored a woman's right to choose gay marriage, uh, the environment, uh, you name it, the, the, the liberal agenda. Um, but it doesn't. Uh, today. There are many Republicans who do, obviously, and I could become one of those. But the Democratic Party, I think, more closely reflects my general views of social policy than does the Republican Party. Also, I remain a Democrat because I want to continue to influence the Democratic Party away from those young radicals who hate Israel and don't really see much value in uh, Jewish identity or the, or the Jewish religion. Uh, so I want to marginalize uh, that group, the squad, and others. And were I to shift to the Republican Party, I'd have no influence. I don't know if I have any influence today in the Democratic Party, having defended President Trump on the floor of the Senate. But I still think I do, and maybe it's wishful thinking. But the question is really a good one. And I have to tell you, frankly, it's a question that President Trump asked me uh, once when I was having uh, dinner with him. And I gave him some of the same answers that I've, I've given you here today. So thanks for your great question.
Our next call is from Mel in New Jersey. Hey, Alan. Your dirt show is usually very interesting, but since the election, you've actually been boring. <laughs> you've been constantly pointing out that there could be a legal challenge to this, the court decision in Pennsylvania to allow them to count ballots that arrived after Election Day because the legislature did not allow that. But you've been very boring. You keep repeating it as if it's an insight. The fact is that there were not enough of those votes, ballots, to change the result in Pennsylvania. So you keep saying there's a legal challenge that could affect the outcome. It can't affect the outcome, and it's just distracting and boring to keep hearing about it. And then yesterday, you misspoke. You said on the Bartiromo show, which I didn't hear, that the problem is that the challenges to the court decision to allow them to count votes after the election. I heard that on Rush Limbaugh, who I despise, but he said that you said that the court said they could count votes after election day. And I thought he must have misquoted you because you wouldn't have said something so inaccurate. But then I, he played the clip from Maria Bartonaro, and that's what you said. I'm sure it was a mistake. And in fact, on the more recent their show, you said it correctly, that the court decision was to allow them to count ballots that arrived after Election Day. But go back to the Maria Bartonomo show and listen to what you said, and you'll see that you misspoke. I'm sure it was unintentional, but you've just been obsessed with this, and somehow you just keep going back to it, and it's uh, just been very boring. Hey, you really know how to hurt a guy. Uh, you can call me anything you want, wrong, controversial, but boring, my God. I think of my tombstone as saying he was never boring. I'll have to have a footnote now uh, saying, yeah, but this guy says I'm boring. Okay, I'll try my best not to be boring. I think there's a difference between being boring and being repetitive. I think you're right. I've been repetitive. Um, by the way, on the um, um, Maria show, I think what I said, certainly what I meant, is whether the votes will count, whether the votes will count if they were received after uh, the close of business on Election Day. That's an accurate statement. Uh, the court said the vote should count. The legislature suggested the vote shouldn't count. Uh, I may have been sloppy in how I put it, whether, the, whether they will count the votes, meaning suggesting that I meant whether they would actually tabulate the votes, but I meant whether the votes would count in the final tabulation. So I don't think I was wrong substantively, but I may well have uh, misstated it. Look, you have a point. I have been obsessed over the Pennsylvania issue because so many of my colleagues have been saying there's no legal claim there. There's no legal claim there. I think there is a legal claim there. I'm not going to bore you again by going over the legal claim, but I think there are two arguments in Pennsylvania that could prevail if the numbers were there, but the numbers aren't there. So perhaps I should spend less time on the theoretical abstract issue, but it was really in response to the argument that uh, there's no legal claim here. So appreciate your call. I'll try my best not to bore you anymore, but if you think I'm boring you, let me know. I'm happy to change my tone, change my content, because the one thing I never want to do is bore you. Our next call is from my hometown where I was born and brought up, Brooklyn. My question is fairly simple. You have a lot of a lot of perspective on the minority viewpoints and 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 facing your opponent's point of view. What's your opinion on the Skokie case? I think the people, the neo Nazis, were deplorable, ugly, but we do have to be tolerant of the opponent's point of view. What's your take on that? Great question. Thank you. I actually played a role in that. I was on the board of the American Civil Liberties Union. I spoke out actively. In favor of the ACLU, I wrote about it. Uh, I think the ACLU did the right thing by opposing the censorship of the Nazis who marched through Skokie. Look, if the Nazis who marched through Skokie had slipped on a banana peel and, 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 and uh, ended up uh, hurt, I wouldn't have shed a tear. They're despicable. They're horrible. And they picked Skokie purposely because it's a neighborhood of many Jewish Holocaust survivors and their families. They did it to provoke. They did it to get people angry. They did it to get people mad. Um, but uh, you can't have a rule that applies differently to Nazis in Skokie and to Martin Luther King in Birmingham. Uh, Martin Luther King wanted to provoke. He was a good provoker. He did good trouble, to quote John Lewis. Um, and these Nazis did bad things, bad trouble. 
but the First Amendment doesn't distinguish between good and bad speech. And so if you want to protect the speech of guys who you like, the good guys, the good women, then you have to protect the speech of the bad guys. And that's why I was in favor of uh, defending the rights of Nazis to march to the Skokie. It got me into a lot of trouble with my mother. She called and she says to me, Avi, that was my name growing up, Avi, whose side are you on, the Jews and the Nazis? I said, Mom, on the side of the First Amendment, I'm your mother. Don't talk to me that way. You either have to pick the Jews or the Nazis. Whose side are you on? I said, I'm not on the side of the Nazis. I'm on the side of free speech. She says, I don't know, you, you fancy academics, you don't know how to pick sides. No, it's true. I don't know how to pick sides. I always pick the Constitution, and sometimes the Constitution lands me on the side of the Nazis. Sometimes it lands me on the side of uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, the Constitution doesn't pick and choose, and neither do I. Our next call is from Jim in California. Um, my question is, if you're right, and on January 20th, Joe Biden stands and swears to uphold the Constitution of the United States, isn't there a conflict as he's also told us that he's going to take away our Second Amendment? Um, is, that, is that a conflict? It's a good question. Uh, first of all, Joe Biden hasn't said he's going to take away the Second Amendment. He said he supports the Second Amendment, but he's going to seek reasonable gun control. I support that as well. If I were rewriting the Constitution personally, I don't think I would put the Second Amendment in. It's the only Constitution that I know of that gives people a constitutional right to bear arms. I understand the history that led to it, and I'm not in favor of eliminating the Second Amendment. I'm in favor of enforcing it, but it includes the word reasonable in it. And I think the word reasonable modifies the whole Second Amendment and allows for a reasonable gun control, reasonable restrictions on who should own guns, reasonable tests, uh, uh, etc. But let me be very clear. If a president ran and said, I am running on the platform of abolishing the Second Amendment through the constitutional process, through the amending process, he would be a legitimate president. If a president ran and said, I'm in favor of abolishing the First Amendment or the Fifth Amendment or the 18th Amendment, as people did run, to abolish the 18th Amendment prohibition, um, you can run for president and be in favor of changing the Constitution as long as the process of change is the constitutionally authorized process of amending the Constitution, which is extraordinarily difficult to do. We will have the Second Amendment with us forever, certainly during my lifetime and the lifetime of everybody viewing and listening to, to this show. So the question is how to protect the safety of Americans within the confines of the Second Amendment. What exceeds the Second Amendment, what does not? Reasonable checks, reasonable waiting t periods, reasonable uh, controls on sales of guns uh, in, in, in flea markets and other, other places. These are all subject to debates. I tend to be on the side of reasonable uh, gun control. Friends of mine are not on that side. One of the things we debate, one of the things we vote for presidents based on. Uh, President Trump was a more aggressive defender of the Second Amendment, uh, a Biden a less aggressive defender of the Second Amendment. We had an election. It wasn't decided on the Second Amendment. It was decided on a range of issues, but presidents get the right to effectuate policies that they support when they're elected. So no, there's no conflict between a president raising his hand to support the Constitution, even if he opposes certain provisions of the Constitution, as long as he opposes them within the constraints of the Constitution itself. Great, great question. Thanks. Our final call today is from Chance in Texas. I just don't understand why Trump would concede on things. I mean, it, the Constitution is very clear that legislators make the law. You've got governors and secretary of state that have issued these, these ballots to be mailed out. Why are we not challenging this? We, we, we have to stand up to this. I'm I'm one of I'm one of Trump's biggest supporters. I'm I'm one of his biggest donators. But if he concedes on this, it, I don't know if I'll, I'll I'll vote for him again. We got to stand up to this. I mean, the Constitution is clear. Why are we not pushed back on this? Now you understand from I think this caller who makes an interesting point why President Trump probably won't 
concede or certainly won't concede in a way that makes it sound like he agrees that the election was a proper election. A lot of his base don't want him to concede. A lot of his base want him to continue fighting. And he is continuing to fight. Uh, challenges in court are being done on a daily basis. They will soon end, probably, because we'll reach within a couple of weeks the safe harbor provision time and the uh, electoral college meeting time. But I think we'll see challenges, and I don't think we'll see a concession. And he may run again for president in 2024. And if he does, he obviously wants to keep his base intact. I, I don't have a problem with presidents not conceding or with presidents litigating and challenging as long as they cooperate with the transition and don't try to delegitimate the incoming president. I hope that President Trump will be at the inauguration. I hope he will invite um, President-elect uh, Biden uh, to the White House. I hope the transition will be a peaceful one within the traditions of America in the past, um, the way it was done in, in past elections, often unhappily, but um, but with um, but with uh, class, um, and my hope is that we will see a transition and that we'll see a successful presidency. Whoever is elected president, I want to see a successful presidency. I did not vote for Donald Trump in 2016. I voted for Hillary Clinton. I campaigned for her. I contributed to her. I enthusiastically supported her. And yet, when President Trump was elected, I hoped and prayed for a successful presidency because I'm an American first and a Democrat second. So um, my hope is we will have a successful transition and a successful presidency. So we now are coming to Thanksgiving Day, a day that all Americans can join uh, together and show thanks for uh, where we are and how we, those of us who have survived the pandemic, have done so. Uh, we should show remorse and, and great concern for those who haven't survived, for those who are sick. Uh, I hope Thanksgiving will bring us together. It's a day of family. I'm planning to have a, a turkey with uh, my family, uh, small family, my, my very small family. We're not having guests and we're not having family members travel to us. We're going to have a Zoom in which we uh, all uh, indicate our thankfulness for uh, being together. Uh, and so on Thursday, I'm going to take off to be with my family and help my wife prepare the turkey. Mostly I help her by staying out of the kitchen, but you know, if she needs me to do something, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, in any event, we'll be back after Thanksgiving. I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving day and thank you so much for being such loyal listeners and viewers and subscribers, uh, to the dirt show. See you soon. An important part of The Der Show is your voice, your questions, your comments. Please call 24-7. The number is 216-710-0050. Keep your comments short and to the point. Again, the number for you to call 24-7 is 216-710-0050. Hard questions, criticisms, everything's fine. Just keep your questions short and I'll answer them all on The Dirt Show.